This is the fifth and final video in our five-part series on learning. In this video, we're going to look at latent learning and cognitive maps based on the work of Edward Tolman. Then, we're going to discuss observational or social learning and the work of Albert Bandura and his famous Bobo doll experiment. We will look at the implications of both of these concepts as it relates to our understanding of learning. Let's start with a question. How do we know that learning has occurred? Let's think back to classical conditioning. How do we know that learning has occurred in this dog? He used to not salivate to the sound of a bell ringing, but now he does. And how about operant conditioning? How do we know our rat has learned? In both cases, they showed a change in behavior due to experience. They evidenced learning by changing their behavior. The dog learned to associate the bell with impending food and the rat learned to associate the pushing of the lever with the reinforcer, food. Can learning occur without a change in behavior? Can learning happen, happen unintentionally and not be evidenced? Can learning happen without associating two stimuli or without a reinforcer present? Let's look at an interesting experiment conducted by Edward Tolman. In this experiment, Tolman used three groups of rats. One group of rats was given reinforcers to reward their behavior of solving a maze. Over many trials, they made fewer and fewer mistakes as they learned their way through the maze and to the food. Another group was put through the same trials, but they were never reinforced upon finishing the maze. As you might predict, they made many more mistakes throughout the experiment and failed to truly master the maze. Then Tolman took a third group of rats, and for the first 10 days of the trial, he gave no reinforcement. So for 10 days, he put the rats in the maze, gave them no reinforcement if they made it to the end. The data on the number of errors for this group mirrored the results of the previous group that had not been reinforced. That makes sense, because so far they have had the exact same conditions. But then, on day 11, Tolman finally started reinforcing the rats for getting to the end. What do you think happened over the next couple days? Well, let's look at this graph of the data. In a two-day period from day 10 to day 12, they reduced their number of errors to equal the same of proficiency in the maze as the group that had been reinforced the entire time, the green line here. They improved as much in two days as it took the always reinforced uh, rats over a seven-day period to make that much improvement. They did that in two days. And eventually, this group outperformed the always reinforced group. What does this tell us? What's going on here? How can they make up this much ground in such a short amount of time? It shows us that the rats were learning in these early stages when there was no reinforcement. They just had no reason to evidence that learning. We, this, we call this kind of learning latent learning. Tolman suggested that the mere exposure to the maze allowed the rats to build a cognitive map that they later used to more quickly solve the maze. A cognitive map is a mental representation of our physical surroundings. We build cognitive maps all the time. It's what allows us to move around our house in the dark and not bump into things. Through his experiment, Tolman exhibited that learning can happen passively, without us knowing it. This learning that occurs has just not been evidenced yet. There's been no motivation for, in this case, the rats to show that they knew the maze. When that reinforcement was presented, they quickly showed that they had been learning uh, by their, uh, vast, or their very fast increase in performance. Now let's move on to observational learning, or social learning. Albert Bandura had studied associative learning, both classical and operant conditioning, and while he found the principles valid, he felt that they alone could not explain the sheer volume of learning that goes on. How could anyone have the time or opportunity to have so many experiences? He set out to show that there was a process through which we can learn from other people's experience. He called it observational learning, and it became the basis of his theory of so, his social theory, a social learning theory. Let's describe Bandura's classic Bobo experiment. 
In the Bobo doll experiment, children were shown a film of an adult playing violently with a Bobo doll. The adult would hit, kick, throw the doll, yelp the doll, and in all other ways abuse it. Later, when the children were left alone in a room with many toys, including the Bobo doll, they mimicked the behavior they'd seen by the mo seen modeled by the adult. Not only did they mirror the behaviors of the adult, they found other ways, other creative ways to act violently towards the doll. Children who had not seen the violent behavior modeled did not show these levels of aggression towards the Bobo doll. The children had been had learned by observation. Well, what are the implications of this understanding? What does this mean for us? Well, one of the things it shows us is the importance of the concept of modeling. Whether we're an older brother or sister, a parent, a teacher, a boss, we need to model the behavior we'd like people to, 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 to do. Uh, especially for children, they see and hear everything. We also need to be aware of what media our children are seeing. Are violent TV shows, movies, and video games likely to make children more violent? Well, there's been a lot of research done in this field. When I was growing up, there was a lot less violence on TV. The most violent things I saw were cartoons. The thing about these cartoons, and, and the question of whether they cause children to be violent, is that the violence in them is so exaggerated that children uh, intuitively understand that it's not real. In some of these realistic video games, I worry about the blurring of the lines between reality and, and fantasy. The television shows I watched growing up uh, had some violence in them. One in particular that stands out to me was a show called The A-Team. They've made a recent movie remake of it. But something interesting happened during that time of that, of that television show. The producers of that television show were very aware of the issues about the amount of violence they had in their show. Uh, throughout the show, there were multiple explosions and car crashes and guns being fired, but every scene showed someone walking away from those events. They were very careful to not show uh, someone being injured. Now, at first, that sounds like that would be a good thing, to not have people being injured in these uh, events. But on some level, it's a bad thing. To show all these violent behaviors with no repercussion, no one being injured, no one being sad, no one being punished, it almost makes it seem like the violence, um, that violence doesn't result in these things in real life. And we have to be careful to explain to children what's real and what's not. Children are cognitively aware uh, that what they're seeing is, is fantasy, but however, the more realistic the violence is, uh, the more we blur that line. Now, can we use modeling to promote pro-social behaviors or good behaviors? Before we get to that, let me make one last point about violence in television shows and movies and video games. While there is evidence that shows there's a correlation uh, between watching violence on TV or in movies and uh, engaging in violent behavior, there's no uh, certain causal data to show that that is a, a causation effect there. Also, kids pick and choose which models they'll follow. If we think about it in the movies, the action heroes often commit just as much violence as the villains. Yet, when the kids uh, reenact or act out these movies or pick and choose what costumes they want to be, they typically will uh, model the behavior uh, or follow the models of the heroes' behaviors because in those movies the heroes were reinforced for their behaviors while the villains were often punished for their behavior. And this leads to an interesting question. Is observational learning just an extension of operant conditioning? Meaning, if I observe someone behaving, and as a result they're rewarded or reinforced, might I be tempted to uh, engage in that behavior? Versus if someone is, if I observe someone behaving and do that behavior, they receive kind of some kind of punishment, might I refrain from doing that behavior? It's an interesting idea that some people have argued. If you see an, an older or younger sibling being punished for some behavior, you might likely avoid that behavior. And conversely, if you see them being rewarded for that behavior, you may follow that modeled behavior. So it's kind of an extension via someone else of operant conditioning. So there is argued that social learning or observational learning is not a unique type of learning, but it's just a way of engaging in the types of learning that we've already uh, learned about both classical and operant conditioning. Well, the good news is, modeling can be used to promote pro-social behaviors. 
So when our heroes or our peers that we look up to or our parents or our teachers uh, model uh, pro-social behaviors or good behaviors, it, it may help us learn those behaviors vicariously through them through observational learning. So that wraps up our unit on learning. This, these series of videos certainly, while long, don't have everything we need to, to know uh, for our unit on learning. It does cover the major, uh, they certainly cover the major topics that we're going to be discussing in class.